So welcome to lesson two of Macbeth. We're going to meet the characters today. The play of Macbeth is a play of ambition where each character has a role in the debate. And the question that Shakespeare poses to his audience is, what happens when ambition takes over a good man? And the play deals with the build up and therefore the consequences of those actions driven by ambition. Until the 20th century, students of literature used to see characters as real people who had their own lives in the story that was presented. But then students realised that characters are a construct. A construct is where the writer has made up or invented that character in order to show a particular viewpoint on a complex issue. Now the complex issue in our play is the theme of ambition. What happens when people don't have enough? What happens when they have too much? What happens when it overwhelms? Is it good to have ambition? Is it wrong to have ambition? Where can it ultimately lead you? So each of the characters has been invented to tell us something about that. So we're going to be introduced to each of these characters in turn and we're going to look at what their role is within the story. So this is Macbeth, the main character whom the play is named after. He's a general in the Scottish army and his title is Thane of Glams. Thane means Lord, so he's Lord of the part of Glams in Scotland. He's incredibly patriotic and very good at his job and he wins the battle by killing the traitor, the Thane of Cawdor. And as a result, the king awards him with that title. So he becomes the Thane of Cawdor. Now on his journey home, he encounters three witches who predict that he will become Thane of Cawdor and king. Macbeth, rather than waiting to become king naturally, decides that he is going to follow his fatal flaw, which is ambition. Oh. And that is what makes him a tragic hero. He's a great hero. Everybody loves, respects and admires him at the beginning of the play. But he becomes a tragic hero, more of a villain, because the ambition makes him want to kill the king. And when you kill an innocent king or any king, then you are committing regicide. Because reg, if you realise from our queen, Regina, reg means regal, means kingly or queenly. So he kills the king through ambition and that becomes his Hamasha. He turns into an evil villain who's tormented by his deeds. He can't get out of evil deeds. He regrets the deeds he's committed, but he's still driven by paranoia, which ultimately leads to his death. Because face it, if you're a writer in the 16th century, you can't allow evil to survive, can you? So Shakespeare had to kill off this character at the end However, there is an element of sympathy that some viewers have said they felt for Macbeth because, okay, he is ambitious, but at least he's led his ambition through to the end. He never really changes his mind and he's determined to keep that crown on his head, even if it is a fruitless crown and doesn't provide him with any heirs. So this is Lady Macbeth. She is wife to Macbeth. Unusually at the time, the relationship is based on equality. They are absolutely devoted to one another and Macbeth even writes a letter to Lady Macbeth calling her my dearest partner of greatness. Therefore, he respects her and because he listens to her, he's able to be manipulated by her. On the one hand, the witches have planted this seed that one day Macbeth might become king on the other hand, Lady Macbeth exploits that weakness, that desire to become king, and her ambition drives him forward. She organises the murder of King Duncan, which Macbeth himself must conduct, and therefore opens the path for Macbeth to realise his true ambitions. She does it because she cares for him, she's proud of him, she thinks he's got it in him, but she does believe that he's too innocent to carry it out himself, which is why she organises it for him. Now, as the play progresses, the marriage becomes less successful as Macbeth is determined to rule with violence and ambition. And there's no place for Lady Macbeth. So she becomes increasingly more remorseful. And there's a famous scene in the play where she sleepwalks and imagines she sees the blood of King Duncan on her hand because of her part in the earlier murder. Off stage, she commits suicide. We never know why, but we realise that ambition is the seed of evil. And as a result, you have to die. 
So here is the victim of that crime, of regicide. His name is King Duncan, and he's a very successful king. We only see him in Act 1. The main role we see him presented in is of intelligence gatherer. So while the battle is going on between the Norwegians and the Scots, this Scottish king is gathering information from men who've been fighting on that battlefield. And it shows us that he listens to those around him. He's not ambitious. He doesn't seek to dictate or control. He rules by consensus, allowing his lords to provide him with the information so he can make the best decision for his country. He's described in the book as meek and mild, and we see him as the entirely innocent victim. It's his generosity which um, ultimately leads to his death. Because he gives the title of Thane of Cawdor to Macbeth, when he is staying at Macbeth's castle after the battle, he's opened himself up to the fact that he could be murdered because his guards are not protecting him as he sleeps in his bedchamber. So this man's not ambitious, he represents goodness. Here we have Malcolm, the eldest son of King Duncan. There is another son called Donald Bain, but shortly after the murder has occurred, he banishes, he goes over to Ireland, we don't hear him anymore. So Malcolm believes in the rule of succession. So that is that a king has a son and the son becomes the king and then that king has a son and he becomes king in a long line of succession. And he's a firm believer of that. So when Macbeth suddenly becomes king because Malcolm has fled to England, one for his safety and later two to raise an army against Macbeth, there's obviously a gap there, a power vacuum. So Macbeth fills that and Malcolm's absolutely furious. He believes in values of goodness, loyalty and justice. And that's why his ambition is not one about self-greed or power. His is to restore that natural order of the rule of succession. And he does achieve that at the end of the play. Banquo is also a brave warrior. He fought on the battlefield with Macbeth at the beginning of the play, but he's a nobleman and he doesn't have as much status and authority as Macbeth, who is a thane. Banquo, during his lifetime, represents goodness because he questions the superstition of the three witches who predict that Macbeth will become king, but that Banquo's sons will become king. The quote is, thou shalt get kings. This role of Banquo is the what if character. And I call him this because you ask yourself, what if Macbeth had acted in the way that Banquo did and he had ignored the witches? If this had been the case, then none of the tragedy that unfolds in the rest of the play would have taken place. The rebuke goes beyond Banquo's life though, because when Banquo begins to show super, um, suspicion rather between Macbeth becoming king and Duncan being murdered, trying to put two and two together and coming up with four, Macbeth is so paranoid that his power will be taken away from him that he arranges for two murderers to kill Banquo. After Banquo's death, this is not the end of Banquo's story, he returns to a banqueting table that is there to celebrate Macbeth becoming king by sitting as a ghost on what was Banquo's chair in life. So he sits on the empty chair, pointing his finger at Macbeth, rebuking him, letting him know that he is aware that Macbeth is a murderer. And so the role of this character goes beyond the simple life of the character. And although he doesn't appear beyond Act 3, the implications of his actions that somebody out there knows that Macbeth is ambitious and that ambition has drove him, driven him to become a murderer is clear for the rest of the play. So this character is not ambitious and he is the foil, that's the opposite, to Macbeth. Macduff is another Scottish nobleman. He's probably the character who is most loyal to the king and in the end he becomes the leader of the army which is raised to defeat Macbeth. So he's very much in support of Malcolm and believes in the rights of succession. Because he goes to England after seeing the murder of King Duncan, he's the first person to enter the bedchamber and he sees the blood everywhere. His words are, oh, horror, horror, horror. And that galvanises him into action to stop the murder getting away with it. So what he does is he goes to England and as he's there, Macbeth finds out that Macduff is raising an army against him 
and out of revenge he has Macduff's wife and children killed. And when Macduff finds out, finds out, he says, oh my pretty babes, what, all of them? All my pretty babes? And he is so much in a state of despair that he is encouraged to take that grief and place it into righteous anger. So he becomes a revenge hero, which is the complete opposite of foil to Macbeth. And he sees the restoration of order as his key ambition. It becomes a crusade for him. So it becomes rightful that Macduff is the one to kill Macbeth at the end of the play and therefore restore order for Malcolm, who becomes the new king. Right, so here are the last characters now. They're known as the Three Witches or the Three Weird Sisters or sometimes they're known as the Hags. They're not actually sisters. We never really find out what they are and that's intentional. They're meant to be very vague and ambiguous so that the audience can make up their own mind about the power they have within the story. Some people think they're just meddlesome characters. They're involved in a mischievous plot. They think it's a bit of a joke to tell Macbeth that he will become king one day. Other people think they have no power at all. They've said this idea, but the seed for ambition was already planted in Macbeth's head. So therefore, they're just, quote, bubbles on the earth. Even Macbeth says, what are thou, not who are thou. They provide the prophecy at the beginning of the story. We shall become Thane of Cawdor and King Hereafter. And then when Hecate, their queen, finds out, she's absolutely furious, but she makes an even more sinister suggestion in Act 3, and she predicts that Macbeth will become consumed with his own ambition and that he will believe everything the witches said and he will go back to the witches, which is exactly what happens in Act 4. And he returns to the spell, double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron, bubble. And with that spell, Macbeth takes a drink from the cauldron and he begins to have hallucinations like a drug trip. And as he hallucinates, he sees his three things. One of them is telling him that none of women born shall harm Macbeth. And so Macbeth thinks he's invincible because everyone's born of a woman, right? Wrong. One character was lifted from his mother in a caesarean section. Another one is that he will be safe until Burnham Wood reaches Dunsinane. Well, have you ever heard of a wood moving and going to a castle at Dunsinane? Macbeth disregards that. And the other one is that he shall only be safe as long as Macduff is not around. Beware Macduff. And so Macbeth listens to these suggestions, wholeheartedly believes them because by this stage he's incredibly gullible. And some people claim it's the witches who have made Macbeth the evil character that he is. Other people believe that evil comes from within and that Macbeth is responsible for himself. A third group of people believe that it was Lady Macbeth who encouraged him in the initial listening of the Weird Sisters prophecy. It's up to you to make up your mind who you think is responsible for this man's ambition, his tragic flaw becoming his homage. We've met the main characters now. There are other minor characters, but we'll encounter those as we read through the play together. What we've learned so far is that characters are not real life people with lives of their own. They are indeed constructs that the writer has invented to be able to represent a particular view. So they have a viewpoint on a given theme. And the main theme in this play is ambition. And we are exploring how far ambition can take us before we are controlled by ambition. What you're going to do now is to switch over to Google Classroom Go to lesson two, meeting the characters. You've watched this video, so now you're going to imagine that these characters have just, just opened up an Instagram account and you're going to write a summary of their bio. You can include things like their thoughts, their feelings, their beliefs, what's important to them, to write a summary of what you've learned so far. And then when you've done that, you can sit down for 25 minutes with a nice cup of tea and you can enjoy the animated tales version of the play so that you have an overview before we meet one another at the end of the week when we're going to read through Act 1, Scene 1 and 2 together. So enjoy this task. I look forward to seeing what you have. Just make sure that you upload it as a Google Doc and then I will be able to give you feedback. Well done then, folks.